As we've said, we're spending all this week talking with every single one of the Democratic candidates seeking to replace Joe Kennedy. A little bit later, we'll hear from attorney Ben Siegel. But first up is Natalia Linos, an epidemiologist, the executive director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, and a member of the Poor People's Campaign COVID-19 Health Justice Advisory Committee. She previously focused on the impact of climate change on health in poor communities for the UN. I spoke with her yesterday. Natalia Linos, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Since you are the only epidemiologist in this race, I want to ask you, you're running for federal office, but I'm curious what your take is on what's gone well here in Massachusetts when it comes to our handling of the pandemic and what uh, the state, broadly speaking, from the governor down to ordinary residents, what we should have done differently. So Massachusetts has done better than a lot of other places. So we have to acknowledge that the governor set, you know, data driven markers said, you know, this is how we're going to move across stages. Um, I think what was missing from the very beginning, not only here, but across the country was a health equity lens. As a social epidemiologist, um, I know and anyone who has studied public health that diseases and, you know, pandemics emerge across our divisions, discrimination, marginalization, racism plays out in ways. So we should have predicted that some communities would have been hit harder. And I think that foresight should have led to the governor and others across the country to put more resources to communities such as Chelsea. So that was a failure, I think, that epidemiologists knew from the beginning. What I see now is uh, the fact that we've maybe moved a little too fast to open, for example, indoor restaurants. I do worry that as parents like myself think about whether we'll be able to send kids to school safely, that we may have gone too far to open too quickly and we may have to shut down again. So there's still a lot to be done. Massachusetts has done better than most of the country, but unless we get this under control everywhere, we're in deep trouble. Thank you for that assessment. What makes you want to um, leave the work you're doing right now, which as the current moment has shown us is incredibly important, maybe more important than ever, and become an elected official? Why do you want to make that leap? So Adam, I'm worried about the lack of expertise in Washington right now. I'm also worried about the fact that scientists have been pushed aside, you know, calls for fire Fauci or the fact that the Trump administration, the president, decided to defund the World Health Organization during a global pandemic. I'm worried that these mistakes are going to have a direct impact on every American as well as every resident in District 4. So I decided to run especially because I felt that I had a unique skill set for the moment. I do good work at Harvard and in a research institution. And I was writing papers, you know. Uh, I wrote in the Washington Post an op-ed on the first, after there had only been one death in the US, calling out the inequities and saying we need a health equity approach. I wrote in Foreign Affairs, I joined the Poor People's Campaign Advisory Committee. But there's a difference behind the scenes, you know, being in Washington, making decisions that impact directly the lives of Americans. We need more experts at the table. As a layperson, I've been incredibly dismayed over the past few months at exactly that distrust and, and even violent rejection of expertise and science, uh, in particular, that, that you mentioned. What do you attribute that to? My feeling, and I have no data to back this up, as is the case with many of my feelings, but I feel like there's something uniquely American about the way we reject science at the moment or the moments that we need it most. But I'd love to get your take. I don't know if it's uniquely American. I do think that we need to look at this crisis comparatively and recognize that the U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the deaths from COVID. And we are a wealthy country with some of the best doctors, some of the best nurses, some of the best scientists. So there is, we should be troubled by how we're doing. And the anti-science um, narrative. I do think that the Trump administration is responsible for a lot of it, um, meaning, you know, the fact that President Trump refused to wear a mask till very recently. The mixed messaging, the politis politicization of public health is, is quite scary. But I also think that public health, that we're at fault. You know, we should have been much clearer. Risk communication was never done well here to say what we know, what we don't know, what we're still learning, and to make the public trust that the advice may change, but it's based on the best available information. So 
I worked at the New York City Health Department during the Ebola crisis. I have worked at the UN during other crises, you know, conflict and, you know, other types of crises. And I know that risk communication and just how you speak to the public is critical in the early days. And I think this administration was trying to cover their backs and protect the stock market from fluctuating. And so it was just not honest enough. If you are elected to Congress, uh, I'm curious about the approach that you would take. We've seen sort of a running discussion here in Massachusetts about what the nature of congressional service is or should be. When Ayanna Presley ousted Mike Capuano, she made the case that it was about more than just legislating, that it was about being a leader of a movement. I'm paraphrasing. And we're seeing sort of a similar back and forth underway in, in uh, the race between Joe Kennedy, who you're seeking to replace, and Ed Markey. Do you see a congressperson's role as that of a legislator or of a movement leader? I think the two go together because legislation should reflect what the public wants. What, you know, there is a movement, for example, that is making, you know, on Black Lives Matter, loud and clear saying that we need to do better. So, of course, as the representative, I need to legislate to move that movement into, you know, laws and rules. As someone who has worked on health inequities and someone who has worked globally on things like HIV and the law, I know that laws and policies play out in people's lives, whether they can live to 80 or their lives are cut short. So I think the movements are so important and our legislation should be reflective of that. And I hope to do both. I hope to serve the district by being um, you know, a representative that helps build movements around issues that matter. And I hope to be a legislator that actually uses data and evidence to ensure that the equitable values and the legislation actually results in a better outcome for residents. Two quick questions, uh, iterations of which I'm asking everyone who's running. Uh, it, they're intended to make you guys squirm a tiny bit. You're running to replace Joe Kennedy. If you had to grade him on his tenure as a congressperson, uh, what grade would you give him? You know, I've heard different things from different communities. Uh, some communities he's been very present. And, you know, I've heard from some of the frontline healthcare workers that they really value his sort of support. Um, but I've also heard people who say that um, he hasn't been as present. I think it's unfair to ask someone like me to, to grade him because uh, we are such a diverse district. So the it challenge is. any representative is to respond to all the needs. And I don't think it's, you know, my perspective is, is no more important than people across the district. I've got one more question for you, which you may also deem unfair, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you were unable to vote for yourself on election day or when you submit your mail-in ballot. If you had to vote for one of your rivals in this race, who would you vote for? There are four, including myself, amazing women running. I think our district is ready for a congresswoman, so I would definitely be voting for one of those women. All right. Natalia Linos, thank you for uh, taking the time to chat with us, and good luck in the last few days of your race. Thank you so much.